Assalamu alaikum. This presentation is on the different surgical procedures used to either rotate or displace the arytenoid laryngeal cartilage in the management of aspiration. In patients who have a persistent glottic gap and glottic insufficiency, particularly the posterior glottic gaps. The arytenoid cartilage plays a pivotal role in the adduction of the vocal folds and the closure of the glottis during swallowing. Three of the vocal fold adductors are attached directly to the arytenoid cartilage, including the major vocal fold adductor, the lateral cricoarytenoid muscle, and the thyroarytenoid muscle, and a small contribution from the interarytenoid muscle as well. A fourth muscle, the cricothyroid, helps in vocal fold adduction and elongation. It contracts, it tilts the posterior plate of the cricoid cartilage and displaces the arytenoid cartilage posteriorly. This action would bring about stretching of the vocal fold, lengthening of the vocal fold, and a small amount of adduction as well. The opened glottis configuration resembles an isosceles triangle. The basal part of such triangles has a cross-sectional area that is much higher than the apical part of the triangle. Because the posterior part of the glottis is formed of the arytenoid cartilage, the risk of aspiration in glottal insufficiency is very much influenced by the position and the movement of the arytenoid cartilage through the large area in the posterior part of the open glottis. Plus, of course, the proximity of the pharynx to the posterior part of the larynx, increasing the risk of aspiration if there is glottal insufficiency. And this is the other important factor in the choice of the surgery for aspiration. Uh, the precise identification of the defective factor in the swallowing, like, for example, a glottic incompetence, failure of hyolaryngeal elevation or anterior displacement during swallowing, tongue base factors, loss of laryngeal sensation, cricopharyngeal dysfunction, or any of these factors or any combination of these factors. This should be uh, precisely identified prior to embarking on any surgical intervention. The other important aspect of the choice is we always try conservative rehabilitation first before uh, surgery, but this, the length of the period of rehabilitation should be carefully weighted against the possible complications, the limits of the conservative rehabilitation to correct a defect uh, so that would need some consideration. We also uh, need to consider whether this, uh, the defect is reversible. In that uh, case, you would think about temporary or reversible procedures or whether the defect is permanent. And then you would think about more ultimate uh, solutions for this. Um, should keep in mind that revision surgery for aspirations or alternative surgeries are rather common. It's uh, common to have one or two or even three procedures to try to sort out the problem of aspiration. We can sometimes buy time with a peg, but if the problem is life-threatening and is deemed to be irreversible, then we think about the more a radical type of surgery like resections, laryngeal shunts, and parototal laryngectomies. The next step to consider if there is a large posterior glottic gap or unequal vocal fold levels or continuous aspiration after a failed thyroplasty is to consider surgical procedures to adduct the arytenoid cartilage. And this includes things like injection, augmentation of the arytenoid cartilage itself, or a placement of a small implant into the cricoarytenoid joint, or fixing the cricoarytenoid joint by sutures in an adducted position, 
or um, pulling the lateral cricoarytenoid muscle, which is the main adductor of the arytenoid, uh, forwards and laterally, either through thyroid ala or through the cricoid cartilage. This procedures, the arytenoid adductor procedures, can be complementary to thyroplasties, the cricothyroid approximation, or cricoid uh, plasty operations, or cricopharyngeous myotomies. But the procedure that is used more commonly in the adduction of the arytenoid is the arytenoid rotation procedures, and this would entail rotating the arytenoid in the adducted position by mimicking the action of the major uh, arytenoid adductor, the lateral cricoarytenoid muscle. A needle is passed in the muscular process of the arytenoid and pulled along uh, the fibers of the uh, lateral cricoarytenoid, either through the thyroid ala and the original description of uh, Ishiki, or around the cricoid in the modified version of this. And this would mimic the action of the lateral cricoarytenoid and adduct the arytenoid and help in closing a posterior glottic gap. In the original description of the arytenoid rotation procedures to adduct the arytenoid described by Ishiki, the um, sutures around the lateral cricoarytenoid muscles were passed through the thyroid ala and fixed in this position. So it is an arytenoid thyroid plication procedure. In fact, the fibers of the lateral cricoarytenoid passes all the way to the cricoid cartilage. And Haji came up with the modification of pulling out the uh, sutures around the muscular process of the arytenoid along the fibers of the lateral cricoarytenoid and securing it around the cricoid rather than the thyroid cartilage. And he suggests that this would give a more physiological adduction. The muscular process of the arytenoid cartilage can be approached through a window in the thyroid ala much like the window created for the sideroplasty operation. Just inferior to a line and from the midpoint of the thyroid cartilage that extends uh, parallel to the inferior border of the thyroid cartilage, it should spare the first centimeter or 12 millimeters uh, anteriorly, and you should spare also ab and about 12 millimeters or more inferiorly and have a window with about uh, 12 to 14 millimeters in length and a height of 6 millimeters. The window should never extend beyond the oblique line of the thyroid cartilage because then the window would open into the piriform fossa rather than into the larynx. If the operation of the arytenoid rotation is done on its own without being combined to thyroplasty, then a smaller window in the thyroid ala will be required. This smaller window would have its cranial or upper limit just uh, superior to the mid horizontal line of the thyroid cartilage. Its caudal or inferior limit would be about eight millimeters from the inferior border of the thyroid cartilage. Its posterior limit should never cross beyond the oblique line of the thyroid because then the piriform sinus mucosa would be exposed and its ventral or anterior limit should be about six millimeters from the oblique line. Removing the cartilage and creating this window would expose the underlying muscles and you could see that the transverse, the thyroarytenoid transverse fibers or the lateral cricoarytenoid oblique fibers would be uh, clear and if you look at the point where these two directions of fibers merge, it would be the muscular process of the arytenoid. The depth of the dissection to reach the muscular process of the arytenoid is about one centimeter from the outer table of the thyroid ala or five millimeters from the inner table of the thyroid ala. The thickness of the thyroid ala at this point is usually five millimeters 
and an extra five millimeters would expose the muscular process of the arytenoid. It's important to note the position and relation of the recurrent laryngeal nerve in relation to the thyroid ala window and the dissection to the muscular process of the arytenoid. The recurrent laryngeal nerve passes just medial and deep to the cricothyroid joint and it's also just lateral to the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle, which again is inserted into the muscular process of the arytenoid, but more posteriorly. The other important structure to be preserved is the posterior branch of the superior laryngeal artery, which is a branch of the superior thyroid artery that penetrates the thyrohyoid membrane and travels vertically deep to the inner table of the thyroid cartilage, anterior to the oblique thyroid line, oblique line of the thyroid. And uh, it supplies various laryngeal structures by branches along its route down into the larynx, and it crosses the lateral cricoarytenoid muscle and comes very close to the cricothyroid joint. Another medialization procedure for the arytenoids in posterior glottic gaps is the adduction arytenopexy, in which the cricoarytenoid joint is opened. A 4O proline on a cutting needle is passed through the posterior plate of the cricoid and retrieved through the medial part of the cricoarytenoid facet. And then the needle is passed through the body of the arytenoid and retrieved again to pass through the uh, cricoarytenoid facet out from the posterior plate of the arytenoid again and then a slip knot is done and tightened and this would adduct and fix the arytenoid in the adducting position and help in the control of a posterior glottic gap. In laryngoplasty operations for the reconstruction of a competent larynx after partial laryngectomies or after laryngeal injuries, the primary aim is to provide glottic competency and adequate posterior and lateral walls of the laryngeal inlet to prevent aspiration. And this is mainly achieved by having at least one mobile and adequately functioning cricoarytenoid joint with preservation of the laryngeal innervation of the recurrent laryngeal nerve and the sensation with the superior laryngeal nerve as well. Plus other factors like adequate tilting of the epiglottis over the laryngeal inlet during swallowing and preservation of the contractility of the thyropharyngeus muscle to provide power for bolus uh, trans transpositioning in the pharynx and cricopharyngeus myotomy to help in the opening of the upper oesophageal sphincter. If there is a persistent posterior glottic gap after partial laryngectomies or after laryngeal injuries, one way of sorting this out is injection into one of the arytenoids that is going to augment the arytenoid and help in closing the posterior glottic gap. Another alternative to control a persistent posterior glottic gap after partial laryngectomies or after laryngeal injuries is to insert a small stainless steel nail through the cricoarytenoid joint into the cricoid plate. And this would displace the arytenoid cartilage medially and helps in the control of the um, posterior glottic gap. The operation is done under general anesthesia with microlaryngoscopy approach. By this, we come to the end of this presentation on the different surgical procedures for the medialization, displacement, or rotation of the arytenoid laryngeal cartilage and the management of aspiration. Salam alaikum.